Hello, we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, we are live on uh, this Sunday. Hello, hello, Debbie. Hello, Mike. Hello, everybody joining. Yes, good to see all of you. Hello, Karen. Very excited about today. Uh, I will be talking to Ken Levine, who was always one of my favorite directors on the show because uh, I would corner him and pick his brains about all the other shows that he had worked on. Hello. Who watched the Everybody Loves Raymond reunion? Table Reads. Hello, Anne Marie. Hello, friend of Monica. Yes, who watched the reunion? That was quite uh, the table read, at least, was great. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, everybody. There we go. Uh, yes, uh, it was quite, uh, I think, quite fun to see the chemistry of everybody the moment... Uh, the moment they started getting back into character and reading those scripts. And I think it was fun for Phil and Ray and obviously the whole cast just to see it. And you, you see that magic all of a sudden uh, uh, again happening. I, let's see. Uh, yes, when are we going to get Ray on Instagram? Never. Okay, that ends that. But we will get him to go on one of his kids. Yes, very frustrating. But what are you going to do? Hello, Lily Rosenthal. I, um, let's see. Hello, Teresa. So many of your favorite episodes. But what I loved was the end when they spoke of Peter. Yes, I... Uh, when I asked them what is their fond memories of what are their fond memories of Peter, so many things that we didn't know. And if you, for those of you who didn't watch it, you if you watch to the end, you'll see a lot of uh, information <laughs> coming out that was uh, surprising to Ray and to Phil, who you would think would know, would know everything that was going on on the show. So. There we go. Uh, and for Ken, uh, Ken Levine is joining us from Hollywood and Levine. If it's not from Hollywood and Levine, then I don't recognize. Uh, I, I have to, you know, recognize. Hello. Hello, Alicia. Yes. What else was? Thank you, Teresa. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, let's see who we have. Yes, and that, so that, what you guys were experiencing, hello, Toronto, what you guys were experiencing, hello, Barbara, hello, Philadelphia, uh, close to where Monica Haran is from, Barbara, and Angelie777, hello, um, what you witnessed was a table read, I mean, that's what you would see for the episodes, only it was what, um, a, we already, those shows have aired, so you already kind of can visualize, oh, now I'm remembering where that was in the episode. When we're, hello, Maine. Hello, Aurora in Maine. Hello, Phoenix. Hello, Karen. Uh, you can watch the table read by going to the Myloma site. I posted it a few days ago, and you just click there, and when you go to that site, there's a YouTube link. So you can watch it anytime, and I suggest you watch it. So... You, you have the luxury of having seen the end product. And when, yeah, ELR on Netflix, please. That, I think because of that Peacock deal, I don't know that it's going to happen. Let's see. Uh, uh, because, you know, the, well, you don't know. But it's like any other commodity and the more value it has, the, the, the rarer it is, the more value it has. So, I don't, I'm not privy to the deal at Peacock, but I'm assuming that if they didn't, um, if they didn't make an exclusive or near exclusive, uh, the price would go down. And CBS, let's say, who's selling it, 
wants to get the most money. So there's something there. That, that's probably why it's not going to be on Netflix anytime soon. So, yes, hello. Yes, uh, Phil did a great job. Phil did a great Marco. Hello, Palm Beach Gardens. Good to see you. Hello, Wendell, <laughs> Wendell Poons. Yes. Uh, so we're waiting if Ken can hear me. Uh, he can just request. Let me see if I can, uh, uh, let, me, let me just send him a request because this will be a lot of fun. Uh, and I will put up, let me see. Let's see here. I don't know if you guys can still see me. I am typing to request Ken Levine. Let's see. So Ken has a very... So I, I mentioned that Ken wrote for... Um, Ken wrote for many, many of the biggest sitcoms in history. So when he came to Raymond to direct Raymond, he had already done MASH and Cheers, which... You know, there, there, there are no bigger shows, um, and I don't know, have you guys seen, uh, have you guys seen Cheers? I know MASH uh, seems like it might be a more popular uh, uh, show, but I don't know if Cheers uh, was a popular show. Hello, Scotland. Hello, Elaine in Scotland. Yes, yes. So Cheers... Yeah, so loved MASH. Uh, yes, for those in the U.S., I know that you saw uh, Cheers and MASH, yes. I'm just curious, in Scotland and England, did Cheers play? Yes, great. Yes, in the U.S., yeah. And, and Cheers, actually, they won a crazy amount of Emmys, so, which was good. Uh, have we seen Cheers in Manchester, Norm? Yes, very pop. Thank you, Karen. Very popular in the UK. Good to know. Cheers is on every morning in the UK. And do you guys? I mean, it's a phenomenal show. But do you guys? Because uh, Raymond is more of a family show where there's no, you know, there's no references or anything. So I'm just curious if Cheers. Great. Cheers was on every day before Raymond. Okay, so yeah, Cheers is still showing TV every morning on Channel 4. So in England, you have how many channels? How many of the, is it two, three? I, I remember because I had to, I lived in, um, I lived in Edinburgh, Scotland for a month for the Fringe Festival. And I remember being, it was fascinating to see the channels. Yes, on channel four. Okay. All right, looking for Ken. Here we go, Ken. People are asking how I'm doing. I'm doing well, yes. Really enjoyed being a part of that reunion. Okay, let's see. Searching for Ken again. Let's see. I see Ken Shapiro on there who did the, uh, who, di who basically directed and put together the whole table read, Ken Shapiro, who we will have on the show uh, when, let's see, Ken Levine, Ken Levine. I don't know if you see me typing. Okay, let's see this. Yes, okay, let's do this. Okay, no user available, not sure why. All right, <laughs> it's, it's the beauty of live Instagram. So I was, I was messaging back and forth with Ken this morning. Uh, yeah, Shelly Long, Christy Alley, Cheers started their careers, or believe, yes, I think pretty much so. Let's see. Um... Okay, Ken. Oh, let me let me try and call Ken. He's having here we go. Let's see. Ken. Okay, let's call Ken. This is exciting, everybody. Hey 
Hello, Ken. How are you? Whoops. Hold on, Ken. Okay. So, Ken, are you on your phone? Okay. Let's talk you through this. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, do you see Everybody Loves Raymond 360? I would go to Everybody Loves Raymond 360 first if you want to put me on speakerphone. Yes, I'm, I'm just talking to the live audience so they don't. Uh, let me put you on speaker so they can share in the excitement, Ken. Yeah, of me trying to figure this out. Yes. Okay, so I go to your site. Go to Everybody's Raymond 360 and the upper, yeah. upper left-hand corner where you see Patty Heaton. Right, and I touch that and a screen comes on. Well, it says, today, live, Ken Levine, and little live thing, and then... The screen disappears and goes right back to um, to your original site. Okay, so try. So when you hit that, do you see? Do you see that it says I'm live? Yes. Okay. Let me. So what is your Ken? Uh, this is. Let me just see. Let me try and get you to go live. Because when I search you, you are. Ken, it says you're not on. Are you sure you're online? On your phone, yes, you must be. I must be if I'm getting you. Yeah, and are you Ken Levine or are you Kenneth Levine? Oh, it's it's Hollywood and Levine. Yeah, I searched that and it didn't come up as anybody. So let me just see. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it says no user available. So do this, Ken. Uh, I would restart your phone. And try it again, because this happened to me, even though I'm tech savvy, on the other side. I was trying to join, and it just wouldn't let me. So do you, do you know how to restart your phone? Yeah, so that's going to be a couple of minutes while I reboot the phone, though. That's fine. Well, it's either that or we talk on speakerphone, which I think is not as enjoyable. So, uh, yeah, do a, do a right. yeah, do a restart, and then text me, Ken, and we will... We will see. Uh, sorry, do a restart. Go to Everybody's Raymond 360. Look for that live icon in the upper left, and then click that, and it should say it should send you the request because it's not. I'm not seeing that you're on unless you have some funky setting. And I would say this, Ken. Does your wife have Instagram? No. Okay. And your daughter's not there. Yeah. No, just try. me. Oh, okay. okay, okay. Go go ahead and do a restart and try and join. And if not, just text me and I will call you back if it doesn't work. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, good luck. Good, nope, good luck. All right. So let's talk while Ken is trying to rejoin. Let's talk about um, the table read. So what did you guys enjoy about the table read? Was it the... Uh, um, just seeing them and knowing um, that, uh, knowing what those scenes are, and then all of a sudden seeing it and appreciating those shows. Because in the pro that table read is what kicks off the week for us, the work week for us. So in the normal world, we would have the table read at the beginning of the week, and we, you know, Phil. Uh, in the writers would watch and the network would watch and they would have to decide, well, this was funny and this isn't funny. So you're seeing the benefit of uh, knowing that that show worked. So the work for Phil and the writers and the director was watch a table read, get rid of what doesn't work, figure out what does work, go back and rewrite that script on Monday and then... Um, sorry, on Monday afternoon, and then go back and make those tweaks. And then that table read, there's a version of that every day during the week. So the next day, we see it on its feet the first time, which means the uh, actors are holding the scripts and they're, uh, you know, they're, they don't know their lines yet, but they're walking around kind of getting a feel for the... Uh, for the episode, for how it's going to work. And so there will be a run-through at the end of the day where Phil and all the writers would come down. Ah, yes. Okay, here we go. 
let's see. There's. All right, connecting. Hey, it actually worked. The excitement, Ken, is palpable. So, <laughs> Ken, that happened to me. I'm very tech savvy, as you know. I, I don't want to brag, but I did introduce you to, at least forced you to go on Instagram because you have a huge following in the writing world with your blog, which we'll talk about. So I'm just making you feel better right now. I was joining one, a guy, they're making fun of me. Oh, I guess Tom's old, Tom can't figure it out. And it just didn't give me the option. And it never happened before. Well, you solved it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you solved it. it. It's good to know. And you, you did come way in under the 30 minute mark, which was, uh, it, it took a little while to get that person to join. So, Ken, how, how are you? Hey, hey, and I was able to reboot my phone, okay? So, <laughs> okay, boomer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you young kids bragging about stuff. Um, I just did a mic, Ken. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. So Now I hope I'm worth it. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing, Ken. When, you know, you, you do this really successful blog, about writing. So anybody who's watching who wants to learn about writing, go to Hollywood and Levine and there's a uh, well, there's Hollywood so and Hollywood and Levine is my podcast. Right. Is yeah. your podcast where usually you I mean you talk to everybody across the board. Right. But but a lot of I have even had you on as a guest. Well, you were out of people and I was Yeah, you're actually one of my first guests. So Yeah. <laughs> well, I think my car broke down in front of your house and you said, "Listen, while you're waiting for AAA. That's right. Um, uh, so I would say in the interest of people watching, because you were, you were a director on Raymond, but I'm just going to give this little snapshot. Uh, in the sitcom world, there's a lot of different directors on a series because they'll book out directors early in the season, early in the series. When a season series is unknown, people don't even want to be a director on that. And, you're, you're, you're someone who was on Cheers and, and you know, wrote for, as a writer, right? And I don't know, yeah. did you write, did you, did you direct any Cheers? No, I directed Frasier, but not Cheers. Okay. So you see Everybody Loves Raymond. It's a top 100 show. It has terrible ratings in a terrible time slot. You simultaneously have the ability, which a lot of other directors don't, which is you can create a hit show. So we don't know what's going on in the Ken Levine universe. You may be under development. You may have a show on the air. So when Raymond starts, you, you know, we're, we're not, we're below your level. I, I, I don't want to put us down, but you're coming off of these giant hit shows, right? And in Hollywood, and I think this is what I've been opening people's eyes to, is you're, there are so many moving parts going on at so many different times. Right. So yep. I just wanted to clarify for people, there is no director of Everose Raymond. It does not exist. There's no director of friends. Yes, there are people that do more or less, but you just don't know. Um, you just don't know how it's going to fall out. So let's let's I want to go just to cut to Raymond and then we'll go back a little bit more in your career. But the decision to do the first Raymond episode, how does that come about? Um, I had been directing for a, a number of years. Uh, interestingly, when, um, when Phil and Ray did the pilot of Raymond, we had a show on CBS ourselves called Almost Perfect. Okay. It starred Nancy Travis. And, and when we you were, say, yeah, you know, sorry, when you say we, you have a writing partner. I, I, I had my writing partner, David Isaacs, and also Robin Schiff. The three okay, of us were, sorry. Were involved in that. Okay, I'm going to so, stop. I'm just going to stop here one second. At one point, you were the sh the showrunner of Mash, correct or no? I was the, I was the head writer of Mash. Yes. Okay, so yeah, yes. just to give people the magnitude of your involvement in shows, so almost perfect. Okay, I is was on the, the showrunner. Yeah, creator, yes. showrunner. Okay. Anyway, so for the second season, we were putting our staff together. And we met with Phil 
and we said to him, look, if your pilot doesn't go, we want you to come and be our number two on, on our show. We had that much regard for Phil, and this was before the success of Raymond. Yeah. So now we flash forward a few years, and, um, and I'm directing freelance a lot of different places, and, um, and my agent gets a call from Phil inquiring about my services. And so I met with Phil, and we sat down and talked, and he hired me to do three episodes. Nice. And so I, I did not know that, by the way. I did not know. And what was Phil in that meeting with Phil? Because you're, you're, you're basically, and Phil tells the story himself, where he had been working. He's like telling the showrunner of where he had been working. I have a pilot in development. And so the showrunner's response kind of was like, yeah, you'll be back. You know, you, <laughs> you, your, your show, Everett's Raymond, or whatever it's going to be called, is not going anywhere because, as you know, most things go nowhere. Right, right. And, uh, well, we were hoping it didn't go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're hoping he fails and that helps your... And then, and then he, would have been, he would have been out of work in another 13 weeks. So it kind of worked <laughs> out well for him. <laughs> yes, Sometimes the jobs you don't get are well, the best ones. Ray was fired from news radio after the table read. So... Uh -huh. Ray was cast as the Joe Rogan role on news radio. And after the first, after the table read, his manager got a call that they're going to go another way, which is yeah. code for you're done. And that's, and at that point, Ray called me depressed from Hollywood because he was about to make the most money he's ever made in his life, which was thousands of dollars. And he was going to be able to take care of his family. And so it was kind of a low point. So you never know where that's going to lead. So yeah, I was involved in the pilot of Frasier and um, we replaced Lisa Kudrow. She was the original Roz. Oh, yeah. We replaced her with Harry Gilpin. And, you know, that's that's a sad story because no one's ever heard from Lisa Kudrow ever no. again. I know that. the name from somewhere, though, from but I somewhere, think it's, yeah. yeah. Well, it went to my high school. <laughs> but other than that, it's a real trivia. Yes. You know, whatever happened to Lisa Kudrow? <laughs> yes. Um, that's hysterical. So that's, and I love the, I think the, from the outside, it just feels like, we'll make a show or do this or do this. But there are so many other factors that are involved that you just don't see. So when the audience tunes in in September and goes, how is this terrible show on the air? How did that happen? <laughs> right? Why, why, why didn't they make a good show? There are so many things of that actor wasn't available. The head of the network doesn't like the show and killed what they were trying to do. So there's all these things where, and it's not that they're your excuses, but so many things you have to navigate to bring that good show to air. Absolutely. The pilots just, uh, the, the planets just have to line up. You know, if yeah. Patty Heaton is not available that year because she's on another pilot that winds up not going or she's doing a movie of the week in Yugoslavia, <laughs> then uh, what are you going to do, you know? <laughs> and if, if Brad Garrett is, is off, you know, opening for Frank Sinatra and doesn't want to do a pilot, uh, you got to find somebody else. So these things really do um, have to, to line up there's an awful lot of, you know, kismet that goes into a successful television show. Um, you know, I, I think most successful television shows, um, you know, are hits by accident. You know, that, that things happen to work out. Yeah, and I think, I think it's abundantly clear with that portion because you also, things could work out. And in the final decision, whether to put something on the air. There's a sit down meeting with, for example, the head of CBS and 10 other people in the room. And eight of them might love the star of this one project. And you have a killer show like uh, uh, Seinfeld that doesn't have any following and no real big stars. And they could say, no, I don't think so. And it's done, it's done. And it could be, and there's, 
there's endless stories that are not interesting because it just sounds like, well, we don't know that show. And you're like, yes, you don't know that show. So they become interesting when you hear, here's what happened with Friends. Jennifer Aniston wasn't available. You know, Lisa Kudrow is on another show. Uh, Courtney Cox can't be, and all of a sudden they all came together and you see that success, you know? Right, right. Pete Best. Shows come along at the right time. They're put in the right time slot is another big factor as to how the network programs them. Yes. Um, whether they happen to be in the zeitgeist at the moment, you know, there are just so many elements that that all have to line up. Yeah. And I think so then let's go to because uh, here's a question. And this is one of the things you do get alive. You do get to interrupt your flow versus a podcast with some questions. And somebody saying uh, 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 there's a question about comparing Frasier and ELR. And I would say even in a bigger picture of the shows you've worked on, right? Yeah. The, the vibe, because we've talked about it a lot here, how it was a friendly vibe. Now, you're a director coming in from the outside, as does every director who has to direct a show. You have a team that's been together for five years, and it's like, oh, here's Ken Levine, who thinks he's going to tell us something that we don't already know. Oh, welcome, Mr. I Know Everything. Please, give us your creative genius. Yeah, and so I know. It's, it's like you're the substitute teacher. <laughs> and, and you walk in, you know, and, you know, in terms of the vibe, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story with Raymond. Um, I was about to direct my first episode, and Raymond was a Monday through Friday show. So I was about to start Monday, and it's Sunday night, and it's the Emmys. Okay? And Ray is up for an Emmy, and Patty is up for an Emmy. And Patty wins the Emmy, and Ray doesn't. And I don't really know them. I was there the week before and introduced myself and said hello, but I didn't really know them. And my first thought was, oh no, <laughs> this is going to be grim. <laughs> I have been on sets where if, you know, Christine Baranski wins an Emmy and Sybil Shepherd doesn't, then it's a toxic, horrible atmosphere. OK, so I thought, oh, my God, my first day, I'm going to just be walking into a hornet's nest. And I get there and Ray has a giant cake prepared to give to Patty and to, for everybody to celebrate her win. Okay? Great. And so I, I knew that morning it's like. This is this is a wonderful set. This is a wonderful group. And what you learn is that um, everybody takes their cue from the star. And if the star is a lovely, gracious, down to earth human being, you're going to have a very happy set. And if your star is um, angry, bitter, insecure, all of the above, then it just raises the level of tension. And as a freelance director, when you go from one show where it's like, oh, okay, this is really nice and fun. And you go to the next show and you go, this is going to be a rough week. And then you go to the next show and uh, they're worried about ratings. So everyone is um, a, a little nervous. And then you go to another show where it's a solid hit and everyone is comfortable and knows their role. Um, so you really do have to kind of adjust, because like I said, you're a substitute teacher going from place to place. Yeah, and I think I've made it. That's a great story. I didn't, I mean, obviously I was there, but I don't remember that, but I do know. I don't. You ate a lot of that cake, Tom. <laughs> you but, ate a lot of that cake. But from the outside, obviously knowing, uh, uh, you know, I know Ray extremely well, obviously, but the feeling from us was we were neglected by the Emmys or ignored by the Emmys or not noticed by the Emmys, however you want to say it. So Patty's win was a win for all of us. So it wasn't like Ray's won three years, Patty's won four years, and now Patty has won. Even if that happened, Ray could care less. 
you know, that's the type of guy Ray is, super magnet. But for us, and I think Ray especially, it's like, okay, the show has been anointed. We actually won an Emmy because it seemed like, I think going into season three, we would never be nominated and never win an Emmy. But it's like, okay, well, we think we're doing good work, but oh, well, the Emmys don't think so. So, you know, yeah, that's well, that. it's not, it wasn't like a hot, sexy show. Yeah. You know, but it was just really good and it was quality and people watched it. And I think over time, uh, when people started watching it, by people I mean, you know, academy members. Right. They started watching it and appreciating it and then seeing what else was on and what they were in competition with, then uh, it, you know, I, I think it started finally getting the recognition it deserved, but it wasn't that sexy show like Friends. Oh, you know, oh, oh, it was or it desperate that hot show. Yeah, or Desperate Housewives, which was the ultimate in sexy, blow everybody away. And, you know, Raymond ended up winning an Emmy that up against Desperate Housewives. And there was zero doubt in our minds that Desperate Housewives was going to win because it was the, like you said before, the zeitgeist. I mean, everybody was, ta I think they even might have, they wanted to move the Oscars, I maybe, because it was so popular. I mean, it was so insanely popular. So I think, yes, that's a very astute observation. So... Getting back to now you're on the set for the first week. And what does the director do before you get the, you get the script, right? I'm, I just want to break down the mechanics a little bit. Right. Um, I get the script and I sort of work out kind of in my head, like how I would start to block it. But um, I... Sorry, and blocking it means... For where the, they stand. Okay, where, here yeah. we are in the kitchen. And Ray, I'm going to have you start here. And Patty, I'm going to have you start here. And then I'd like you two to come to the table around here and that sort of thing. You know, I'm not one of those directors that starts right off by saying, okay, mark it down, Patty. On this line, you cross to the refrigerator. And then on this line, you come down to the table. And Ray, I want you to like, you know, turn a little bit and favor her. And you know, it's like, you know, start out and kind of let the actors feel what's comfortable and what's what's good for them. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm looking for performance. Um, I'm, I come from a writing background. So I'm looking to make sure that the story works and that the motivations are there, and that if there is a scene where Patty has to get mad at Ray, um, does she have enough buildup in the lines that she's been given so that she can get there, you know? That the actor doesn't go, I God, I, you know, he walks in the door and in three lines I'm yelling at him. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I have to say that that you guys were so much better at that than most of the other shows that I, I had to direct because there would be scenes that didn't work. And I would say to the uh, cast, this is a writing problem on you other know? shows, on, on other, other shows. shows. Yeah. yeah, on other shows. But uh, but your show was really much more fine tuning than than anything else. Yeah, and I and I think a lot of that has to do with um, Phil comes from the theater. Ray would be involved in every moment of the script writing. Ray and Phil would read the script before the table read, uh, and the you by the time you got to the table read so much time had been spent on the script versus some shows which were so far behind. So they finished at 3 a.m. the night before the table read. So there's a lot of fine tuning, you know, before then. Yeah, um, do you remember too, uh, one of the things that I used to do uh, when I directed a show was after the run through, I would go back to the writing room and, and I would sit and I would, you know, be involved in the discussion 
as to what was being done that day, which I found very helpful because I could then the next morning go down to the stage and if an actor would go, why did they cut this line? I, this line got a laugh that I'd be able to say, they cut it for time. It wasn't you. The yeah. show was five minutes long and we had to cut something. But I, I stayed and pitched out and did the, the um, you know, the rewrite with you guys. Did any other director do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, did, no, and, did I, you, and did you hate me? Well, <laughs> Phil could have said, no, we don't need you. But Phil seemed to be very receptive. And I well, actually got some jokes in. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're the only director that got jokes in. That I know unequivocally. The, uh, did Phil hate you? I don't think so. There was no expression when you left, like, what is Ken doing in our room? There was none of that, <laughs> which, as you know, it's a very, it can be a very hostile environment. And Phil, oh, yes. Phil never had outsiders in the room because it inhibits the creative process. So if you have somebody sitting in the room who's not a writer and they sit there and go, those guys are just goofing off and they're making jokes that are, I don't understand. Like, why aren't they just nose to the grindstone, uh, grindstone and, write, and writing? So for you, I think there's an account of you probably had more experience writing than anybody in that room other than Jeremy Stevens at that point. Right. Right. So you, you're, you're sitting there. So I think there's a, a little bit of respect that you had and also your suggestions. Wait, what do I want to say? You know the room etiquette. And so the room, you're, you're not sitting there going, well, that joke doesn't work. And then we go, <laughs> okay, Ken, what? now what? And so if, if anybody... Um, if anybody ever gets a chance to be in a writer's room, the one thing you have to think is you saw, you're going to solve the problem if you're gonna pitch something. If you're going to ruin something, you better have a thought on how to solve it. So right. if you can say, this line isn't funny, here's three other lines, then it's like, oh, okay, great. But if you just go, yeah, I don't really enjoy that scene. I'll, I'll be out there getting some coffee. Let me know how you work it out. Like that's, right. then the door would be locked and Ken wouldn't be able to get back in. But since you run rooms and you know writing, it, it, it wasn't a problem. But I think what you just said is such a key point for anybody watching who uh, wants to be involved in the creation process. The actors are in the dark. So they'll sit there and, and as a creative person, and we knew our cast was brilliant, they'll sit there and go, oh, they cut it because they don't, they don't like the way I delivered it, I guess. And so all of that go, spins out. And when you, Ken, are in the room, or when Phil says, you know, you, you're, you're, here's why we cut it, it puts them at ease. Yep. And, I don't, and I don't think, uh, you know, you don't ever, it's a little bit of bedside manner that I think a lot of people, when you're the showrunner, you have so much responsibility. You have so much going on. You have casting, you have this, you have the network angry at you. Give me notes, all this stuff. So for you to go, uh, listen, Doris, that one joke that got a laugh, we had to cut it because we cut the earlier scene so that callback doesn't, you don't have the time to do that. You know, you don't right. necessarily. Right. Yeah. And so, and just going back to Ray, because Ray's such a great, and, and I think, you know, I heard this from, from Johnny Carson, which is, you know, let the, let the guests get the laugh because you're there, you don't have to get every laugh. So for Ray, it's like, Ray didn't sit there and go, uh, I have 12 jokes and Patty has 23, why? That's gotta change. That was never Ray's uh, attitude. So yeah, there's was, a famous story, you know, uh, Jack Benny, when there's a Jack Benny show, and somebody said, you give all these great lines to Dennis Day and Don Wilson and Rochester and, and everything else, you know? And he goes, yeah, but it's the Jack Benny show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like yeah. I get credit, everybody laughs, and it's the Jack Benny show. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's lost on, uh, it, I think it, you hit on it before, it comes from that insecurity place. Like if you know you're funny and you can deliver, and it's the same thing with Phil. Phil was such a great writer and knew what was needed. So any, a good idea could come from anywhere. So if, if he got 20 good ideas from into a script that weren't his, he's not sitting there going, oh boy. God. No, that's, yeah. that's, what you, that's what you hope for. <laughs> yes. Is that that you, you have writers who, who can contribute.
Yes, who can, who can, yeah. step, who can step up. So now, just for the process, and let, let me just for a little bit of candy here for the people. Did, was there an episode, because I'm seeing these questions as I scroll, uh, what, was there an episode of the ones you directed, was there a favorite moment with them? And then I want to get back to the actual process, but was there, was there one thing where you were watching going, oh, that's funny? Yes, um, it was an episode called The Sneeze. And um, which now is very apropos for these pandemic days. Um, no, wait, it was not the sneeze. It was it was the what, one where. Um, what good are you? What good are you? Yeah, where um, where Patty is like choking on on an orange slice, and Ray is not paying attention. He's paying attention to the TV, and. Um, so later, so she's pissed at him for that. And later in the episode, he, uh, she gets a splinter. And so now he wants to be, you know, Mr. You know, concerned, doting husband and is coming after her with tweezers. And she doesn't want him to, to do that. And as written in the script, it started in the kitchen and it says, um, that Deborah runs into the living room, Ray follows her, catches her, and there's a bit of a struggle and they right. take out the thing. And and I thought, well, let's see if we can have some fun with this. And, um, and some of the people on the set are saying, well, what are you, this isn't in the script. And I said, yeah, I know, but they'll take it out. If they come down for the run through, they'll, they can just say take too much. It out. Yeah. And so I had them going around the couch and he grabs her by the feet and she squirts away and he gets her and, and, you know, pulls her and turns her over. And, you know, we choreographed this whole thing and, and God bless Patty was just such a good sport. <laughs> You know, I was like, well, what if he drags you? All right, let's try that. Well, it might, might be funnier if we do this or we do that. Um, and so we worked out this whole thing. And, um, you know, and, and I know that, you know, when Phil and you guys come down for the run through, that they don't appreciate surprises. Too much, yeah. Yeah. And, and if it fails, the risk you're taking is, you try this, and that's a big swing that we're talking about here. That's not just uh, uh, be seated instead of standing, Patty. When you right, that. right. No, and, I I took a bit. I took a big swing. What the and heck? So if and, it, and I told him, I said, you're going to see something uh, a little bit more embellished in in this moment. Yeah. And um, you know, and they loved it. They Let loved me. Uh, it, and it can, stayed in. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> so that's uh, that's part of the moment uh, uh, of Ray dragging Patty <laughs> across the floor, and that's that's from the show night that that photo. So that's uh, it made it in, and it and it played in spades. And look, there are jokes that I remember Ray and I pitching, and Phil would come down, and Phil would just go. Put it back the way it was, and you know it's just like okay, <laughs> like, yeah. so and and because you have so much other time, so that's a great. What a great thing, and obviously Patty, who's you know Patty is such an important part of that chemistry because she's this attractive, you know, uh, gifted actress who also is willing to do anything. You know, right. she was just committed and, and and i'm i'm a freelance director too so <laughs> so it's not like it's it's jim burrows yes you know the, the and for, genius of jim burrows it's like it's like yes is this guy can i tell you the story um i tell this on my podcast too um hollywood and levine is my podcast um i i'm telling the story actually um next week because i'm talking about directing but Actors will sometimes test you if you are there for the first time. My first episode was called Pet Cemetery. On Raymond. On Raymond. And it was the one where, um, where one of the kids, Hamster, died. Right. 
and we wind uh, up. That, 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 that's from Pet Cemetery. There there's you Peter, go. Yeah, there's Peter Boyle in it, yes. Right. So the, the last scene which we shot on the stage was in the backyard, which was a funeral, and there was a rain effect. Yes. Okay. A funeral for the pet. Yes. So it's the first day of rehearsal, and we walk to that set, and um, I'm told by my first AD that uh, they've got the rain thing rigged up and ready to go if I want to do the rain effect. And I said, no, this is, this is just the first rehearsal. We don't need to do the rain effect. So I started placing the actors where I wanted them to be. Or I said, okay, it'd be Peter and Doris and then Patty and Ray and Brad Madeline. and the kids will be here and da, 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 da. And uh, Peter goes, well, I really don't want to be there. I want to be like here between Ray and Brad. And, and yeah, let me just stop for a second. Here's Peter Boyle, movie star, young Frankenstein, Joe, season five of Raymond, Ken Levine now faced off with Peter. Right. And I said, well, it actually makes more sense if you're where I originally placed you because you and Doris have a couple of asides to each other. And if you do it there, you're talking across two people. I think I can make it work. I said, okay. And then I turned to the first AD and I said, okay, change of plans. I said, I want to do the rain effect, but only over Peter. <laughs> okay. He laughed, moved back to where I wanted him originally, and we ended up getting along great. Yeah. And, and just because we had that reunion, which I don't know if you caught any of it, no. Peter was such a pussycat. Peter was such a sweet human being, but he had an intimidating presence. And right. if you saw the movie Joe, you're like, okay, a taxi driver, you're like, this is not, this is not the pussycat uh, uh, actor who you're going to say, you know, he, he would stand toe to toe with Phil as well on a couple of points as he should, you know, because he's got comedic instincts, et cetera. Right. But that's, well, that... I, I found one of the things after that moment where I ended up getting along with him great, I said to him, I said, you know, you are in one of my favorite movies. And he goes, hey, Young Frankenstein. I said, no, no, not Young Frankenstein, Joe. Yeah. I love Joe. And he just lit up because not a lot of people remember that movie. And he was just great in it. Yeah. And, and he loved the fact that that I knew and appreciated Joe. So I <laughs> and it's, over. Yeah, he, it's a frightening, and he's a frightening portrayal in Joe, for those of you yeah. who know. It's, it's one of his earliest films that was kind of a breakthrough thing. And I think he still had a day job, which uh, uh, I think somebody, I think he, Peter said, and Lorraine Boyle would know this, but I think he was a maitre d' at a restaurant. And somebody, I, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. The story's correct. I'm pretty sure it was Peter. And, and someone said, didn't I just see you? Uh, in Joe in the movie, he's like, yes. How many in your party? You know, like, uh, yeah, okay. I, but I might not. Uh, it, it might not go anywhere. So yeah, and, and Peter is. Uh, I, I wanted to bring this up, Ken, because of Cheers and Mash. We just did a, a reunion table read on Friday with the cast and and uh, Stefania, the the, the uh, Alex Manestas who played Stefania, and then a Q and A afterwards, which I. Did you guys go back and run rewrite? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. There's, they weren't all as broadcast, the ones that we had access to. And so we didn't go back in and do the as broadcast. And there were a you couple did, of- You did the first drafts. Well, the final, the final draft, the, 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 the table, the, uh, sorry, the shoot night draft. Uh, uh, but some of the jokes were missing. And there was one callback, which was a funny joke, which is in the- um, PMS episode, Bad Moon Rising, where Peter gives a speech basically saying, 
you know, first it starts as a, as this mood, it's a day and a this, and then if eventually it's your whole life and there isn't a day that I don't sit there hoping that a meteor comes down and gives me sweet relief. Okay, that's, that's Frank's line early on. And Peter and Ray at the very end, who's not convinced that this is real, at the very end has now suffered through Deborah's moves at the very end, sure. like, mm -hmm. come on, come on, meteor. <laughs> so it's a callback <laughs> at the end, which Phil remembered during the thing, during the uh, actual event. But what I was going to say to you is you see these reunions going on. Cheers, which I, the number of Emmys that Cheers won is astounding. And the, the amount, the, the writing in that show and the, I mean, when I, when I catch reruns, I'm like, man, it's just, it's, it's this. It's an astounding amount of jokes, but you like these people it, as opposed to, and this sounds, uh, I, I feel like I'm being derogatory, but when you watch 30 Rock, I sit there and go, this is an amazing amount of jokes. Like, oh my gosh, like, it's just like a Gatling gun of jokes, but the people are so cartoony that you don't get invested in them. Yeah, you don't care. You, you don't know, care. I, you have to care about the people first. Right. You know, and their problems have to feel real. And I think one of the reasons why Cheers works, why Raymond works, why the Dick Van Dyke show works right. is that the, the issues that they're going through are universal. Right. You know? and, I, and it's yeah. more it's more fun to write for 30 Rock. It's more fun to write where you go, anything can happen. So anything that pops into my head and it's not more rewarding for the audience. Right. And, it's, and it's a very, and I'm saying this with respect to 30 Rock and Arrested Development. You know, these are, these are laugh machine. I'm like, this is some funny stuff, but you're better off doing a drama with some jokes than this Gatling gun of no tie to the reality of those characters. So cheers, getting back to cheers. If right now, because still b bizarrely, not bizarrely, but in a good way, a lot of those cast members are still around. And if somebody said to you or the Charles, you know, hey, let's do let's do let's do for a giant paycheck, five scripted episodes. What what what? Because that's the constant conversation about Everett's Raymond, because Will and Grace and Gilmore Girls, you know, a lot of people have done it. And what would you say to that? Um, I would be against it, actually. You know, I, I think it's better that the audience thinks of those characters as those characters in that time and place, you know? And to see them all now being in their late 60s, early 70s, um, I don't know, there, there'd be something uh, a little sad about it. Um, I don't think it'll ever happen. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think that Ted or Shelley um, would would want to do it. Um, I have no desire to be on a soundstage with Kirstie Alley anymore. <laughs> a a after her support of Trump, um, <laughs> you know, well, it's like, I, I you know, I, well, if the, I never see Kirstie Alley again, that's fine. Well, uh, <laughs> um, I was going to say the, and I don't know if how much in any way you follow this. This is very bizarre, but I'm watching a behind the scenes of Gilligan's Island. And I'm going, why? So many I unanswered questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> here's why it was, it, it, you know, Gilligan's Island is such an iconic thing. And the thing that I took away from that is the network did not want the show. The network hated the show, okay? CBS hated the show. And uh, uh, I forget the creator's name. Sid Sidney Sheldon, was it? No, um, Sherwood Schwartz. Sherwood Schwartz, okay. Alliteration in some way. Doesn't matter the details. So right. Sherwood Schwartz fights for it, creates Gilligan. Nobody wanted the show. Half of the cast didn't want to be in the show. All of the, it, it, everything was working against that show, but it caught the eye of the public and for some reason it was a giant hit. And then every couple of years, he would campaign after the show ended. CBS, let's do another show. No, we, we didn't. And there's network executives on camera saying, I hated this show. Like, and, and I hated it. I hate it. Do you understand? I don't want to watch. Gilligan's Island is a terrible show. Uh, yes, CBS hated the show. So 
And I remember watching this going, oh, wow, if you create, you know, think about how hard it is to create something. If somebody said, you know, I hated MASH, it was <laughs> despicable, it was a crime. So he convinced them every 10 years or something to do a return to Gilligan's Island. And every time it would be a giant ratings juggernaut. Yeah. And, it, and it's just funny that to have the show that the network got huge ratings from and then they hated it and then you convince them again. So I agree that you don't want to do a reunion of seeing like, because I mean, Seinfeld said it. You don't want to, people going, oh, look how old they look. Because by nature of reruns, you're frozen in time, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. I do think it's a tough thing unless, you know, Will and Grace isn't that long ago. So the reunion is not like, you know, that type of thing. Uh, Ken, I want to say, because we're going to run out of time, and I'm going to ask you to come back again, because we barely hit... Uh, uh, well, maybe next time, next time I'll know how to do it. Well, get on. well if you're, it's unusual to have that phone glitch. I will say you went up against it, and, so, and you, you recovered nicely. And I didn't notice your text uh, uh, right away. Um, uh, the difference between a show like Raymond, like Friends, like Cheers, filmed in front of a live audience, and MASH. MASH is filmed like a movie. So there is no audience. Everything is shot out of order. The, there, there is no laughing. You don't hear any laughing. What, what was your, I mean, there's an upside to, to each, you know, in the single camera, you feel more like a movie. So there's the upside. For comedy, though, you don't have the feedback that's so important to the actor's timing. Yeah, so I love multi-camera shows because, number one, the writers are held accountable, okay? You have 200 strangers sitting in the bleachers, and, uh, and they tell you whether it's funny. It's not just, you know, a single-camera show. It's you and, you know, the other people on the staff, and they're sitting and watching the rough cut, and they're, hilar they're you know, hysterical, but uh, America is going... Uh, what's so funny about that? Right. And I also think that doing a show in front of a live audience creates an energy. And I think that the actors feed off of that energy. And um, you see it time and time again. I see it as a director where, um, where performances just kick into a, a different gear when you know, that there's an actual audience there um, that, uh, yeah, I, I think is, is very special. And I think multi-camera shows have been maligned primarily because there are a lot of bad ones that just use the laugh machine and, and sweeten it. Um, I remember watching Raymond um, a couple of weeks before I started directing it. And there were all these big laughs. And I was wondering, boy, do they, do they sweeten it? And then I came down, like I said, the Friday before I was supposed to direct, I came for the, the shooting night to meet the cast and just see how it all takes place there. And uh, it was clear, those are real laughs. <laughs> Cheers, we had to have that disclaimer at the beginning of the show that Cheers was shot before a live studio audience because people didn't believe it. People thought we were just sweetening the laughs and those laughs are, are genuine. Yeah, and I think uh, we're gonna run out of time. We only have a minute left, but uh, real quickly, uh, sweetening is adding laugh uh, to the actual soundtrack uh, to make it sound funnier. And so we would have to cut down as I'm sure Cheers would the laughs are so big that you have to shorten the laughs in post. Right, you, because you don't, you don't believe it, yeah. Yes, and yeah, otherwise yeah. people are angry. They're like, how dare you sweeten it so much? And I'll tell you, the next time we talk about Phil getting a letter from an angry woman about, I can't watch the show anymore. The laugh track is too loud. And so Phil called her. We'll save that for the next one. <laughs> and then the live audience, yeah. Peter Boyle, the cast, would come alive. When that audience kicked in, the, the material felt brand new. All right, 20 seconds left, Ken. We're gonna, can you come back again later in November? Sure. Because you, selfishly, I so enjoy talking to you. We haven't even 
gotten into the details of directing a show and the challenge of, of all the, you know, those type of things. So I'm going to say goodbye because it's going to cut off, Ken. I'll see you in November. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Ken. Okay.